Chapter 12. Setting the Trap Odysseus looked up and saw his wife. He saw his wife for the first time in 19 years. His heart soared for joy, but he bit his lip, swallowed and said nothing. He got to his feet and followed her up the stairs to her bedchamber. Old man, she said, old man, sit down. I would like to speak with you. I have heard from I've heard about you from my faithful swineherd, e- Eumaeus. He tells me that you have heard rumours that my husband Odysseus is on his way home with tre- chests filled with treasure. The old beggar shook his head. Rumours, madam, nothing but rumours. I have heard nothing but rumours for 19 long years, Penelope said. Now the time has come for me to choose a new husband and bid farewell forever to these walls that have wel- that welcomed me as a wife all those years ago. The old beggar sighed. Madam, I can see your sorrows match my own. But tell me, which of these wretched, wretched suitors will you choose and how will you choose him? Old man, I've been thinking about it all day and I have a plan. Years ago, before he went to fight in distant Troy, my husband's favourite sport was archery. Sweet Odysseus would take his bow, bow, which was still hangs from the wooden peg, on the hall of the feasting, on the wall of the feasting hall, and he would draw a bowstring across it. Then twelve axes would be set in a row, the length of the feasting hall. Twelve ceremonial axes, one behind the other, with their blades to the ground and their hands, handles pointing upwards, and the rings of their handles in a row. When everything had been made ready, Odysseus. I can see him now as though it was yesterday, would take an arrow and fit it to the bowstring. He would draw the bowstring back and loose the arrow through the rings of all twelve ceremonial axe blade handles. No one could match him. I will set the suitors the same task, and whoever comes closest to Odysseus in skill, I will take as a new husband. But old man, it wasn't to pour my heart out to you that I invited you up here this evening. I have had a dream, and often you travelling people are skilled at reading such things. Then, madam, tell me your dream, the old beggar said to Penelope. In my dream, I kept a flock of white, fat, fat white geese. I kept them in my husband's hall, and every day I fed them with my own hands. Then, in my dream, an eagle swooped down from the mountains, flew through the door of the hall, slaughtered all the fat geese, and then, on a, and then sat on a rafter and sang. The old beggar chuckled. Madam, that dream is easily understood. The geese are the suitors who feast in your husband's hall. The eagle is Odysseus, and one day he will return and kill all of them. Yes, 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 old man, I know that, but dreams come to us through two gates, either through a gate of ivory or through a gate of horn. Those dreams that come to us through the curved and decorated gate of ivory are mere fantasies fancies, and fantasies. But the dreams that come to us through the burnished gate of horn carry the truth. Which gate did my dream come through, old man? The old beggar looked at the floor between his feet. I wish I knew, he said. I wish I knew. Penelope sighed. So do I. Then she turned and called over her shoulder. Eurycelia, Eurycelia. The door opened and an ancient servant hobbled into the room. Odysseus recognised her instantly. Eurycelia had been his nursemaid. She had suckled him when he was a baby and looked after him when he was a child. Eurycelia. Penelope said, take this old beggar and wash his feet and give him a new warm woolen cloak for his old shoulders. The old woman beckoned to Odysseus. Old man, come with me, come with me. The beggar got to his feet and followed her. She led the beggar out of the bedchamber and she showed him a bench where he should sit. She fetched a bowl of steaming water. She took off his sandals and washed his feet. She washed his ankles, she washed his calves, she washed his knees. Then suddenly the old woman stopped. She stared in astonishment. Up the inside of the old beggar's thigh, she had seen a scar, a jagged scar. She'd recognised it instantly as the scar that Odysseus had received from the tusk of a wild boar when he was a boy. She looked up into the old beggar's face. It's you, you're home at last. The old beggar reached down and pressed his hand over her mouth. Shh, woman, if you love me, hold your tongue, say nothing. The old nursemaid nodded, her wrinkled face beaming with, beaming with delight. She hobbled off and fetched a warm woolen cloak and gave it to the old beggar. He threw it over his shoulder and he winked at Eurycelia. She smiled fondly back at him. Odysseus made his way downstairs to the dark, silent feasting hall. He t- saw Telemachus sitting alone. 
he whispered, my son, come here. Listen to me and do exactly what I tell you. Take all the weapons that are hanging from the wall and hide them in a locked chamber. If anyone asks you where they are, tell them they've become tarnished and smoke blackened and they've gone to be cleaned and sharpened. Leave only my own bow, bow hanging from its wooden peg and the twelve ceremonial axes. Then, when everything is ready, hide the, a bow for yourself amongst the sh among the shadows by the door and also hide two quivers full of arrows, two swords and two bronze-tipped spears. Then go to old Eurycilia. She alone has recognised me and knows my secret. Tell her that tomorrow, when I signal to her, she is to make her way out of the feasting hall and she is to lock all the doors from the outside. Straight away, Telemash is set to work. Odysseus went outside. He lay down on some soft grass under the countless stars. He wrapped himself in his warm woolen cloak, cloak and whispered a prayer to owl-eyed Athene, closed his eyes and fell into a sweet, oblivious balm of sleep.